Welcome Zoo Assemblyers! My name is Zuka Zalishvili and I'm the founder of Zoo Assembly. Zoo Assembly is an online podcast for the highest yield basic science and clinical knowledge tested on USMLE Step 1 and USMLE Step 2 CK. The information discussed in this podcast is intended only for educational purposes. It's not intended to prevent, diagnose, or to treat the medical conditions in real clinical practice, nor is it intended to reflect the policy and the guidelines of various health institutions. Simply put, we serve you to butcher your step exams. Please subscribe to our podcast, Facebook, Instagram pages, and the YouTube channels down below in the description of this episode so that we keep you tuned for the news at Zoo Assembly. Now, let's start rolling. We are continuing our respiratory pathology series, and today we'll talk about the flow volume loops, obstructive and restrictive lung diseases, and finally we will discuss the mesothelioma. So let's start with flow volume loops. Flow volume loops are very important and high yield because we should know what happens to the normal flow volume loop when the person develops either obstructive or restrictive lung disease. And let's first discuss the general structure of the flow volume loop as a graph, and then we'll talk about the changes associated with the different lung diseases. On the horizontal axis of the flow volume loop, we have the lung volume. And then on the vertical axis, we have expiration on the positive side, meaning the upper side of the vertical axis, and then on the lower or negative side of the vertical axis, we have inhalation. And then we create a loop which determines the airflow rate during the inspiration and during the expiration. The peak point where airflow is maximal during the expiration is called peak expiratory flow rate or PEFR while the peak point on the inspiratory side of the loop where the airflow is maximal is called peak inspiratory flow rate or PIFR and knowing these points is also important to distinguish the obstructive versus restrictive lung diseases And before we move on to changes characteristic of these conditions on the flow volume loop, let's define generally what obstructive and restrictive lung diseases are all about. Obstructive lung disease means that there is some kind of obstruction during expiration. It means that the air cannot be fully expired during the exhalation and Therefore, there is air trapping inside the lungs. If there is air trapping, then it means that the lungs will become over distended and over inflated. Therefore, several vital uh, several capacities and also the several lung volumes will increase, right? For example, let's talk about what happens to residual volume when the person gets obstructive lung disease. As we know from the respiratory physiology, a residual volume is the volume that stays in the lungs after maximal exhalation. If there is obstruction to exhalation of the air, then the amount of air that stays in the lungs after maximal exhalation is definitely increased. Now, on the other hand, we have restrictive lung diseases. And in case of restrictive lung diseases, there is no problem in exhalation of the air. Expiration happens absolutely normally, but the problem is that the lung loses its distensibility or compliance. In other words, the lung becomes more elastic because there is the deposition of either elastic fibers or the collagen fibers in the lung interstitium, which restrict the alveolar expansion during the inhalation. To say it in other words, restrictive lung diseases have 
problem during the inspiration. You cannot get the enough air in the lungs. And if you cannot get enough air in the lungs, then the air that stays in the lungs is also decreased in, in the amount, right? And this explains why residual volume will be decreased in restrictive lung diseases. Let's move on to FRC, or functional residual capacity. As we know, FRC consists of residual volume and expiratory uh, um, expiratory um, volume, right? So, if residual volume is increased in obstructive lung diseases, then FRC will also be increased. While, if the FRC, if the residual volume is decreased in restricted lung diseases, the FRC will also be decreased. The same logic can be applied to total lung capacity, which is the amount of air in the lungs after maximal inhalation. If the obstructive lung diseases have the problem getting air out, then there will be a lot of air accumulated in the lungs after maximal inhalation. Therefore, the TLC will be increased. In contrast, restrictive lung diseases have the problem getting air in. And in that sense, the total lung capacity will be decreased. Let's now move on to probably the most important respiratory parameters when talking about the obstructive versus restrictive diseases. This is FEV1 and FVC. FEV1 is forced expiratory volume in the first second. In other words, when the person inhales maximally and when then and when we ask the patient to exhale uh, w with a force the amount of air that is exhaled in the first second is called FEV1 and then we have the other concept which we have already discussed in the respiratory physiology series this is the FVC or forced vital capacity forced vital capacity is the sum of inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and the expiratory reserve volume. In other words, forced vital capacity is the total amount of air that the patient can exhale after maximal inspiration. And now, why do we care about FEV1 and FEC? We care about them because the FEV1 to FVC ratio can differentiate obstructive versus restrictive lung diseases. The cutoff point for the FEV1 to FVC ratio is 70%. In other words, normally, we should be able to exhale 70% of the air in the first second during the forceful exhalation. Now, what happens in case of the obstructive lung diseases? Guys, do you remember what we said the pathophysiology was for the obstructive diseases? Was it the problem with exhalation or with inhalation? I hope you're telling me that the problem was in exhalation. There is some kind of obstruction during the exhalation, right? And therefore, the forced expiratory volume in the first second, i.e. FEV1, will be significantly decreased. However, FVC is not that dramatically decreased. Yes, it might be slightly lower than a normal patient, but the person with obstructive lung disease will still be able to exhale almost the normal amount of air, albeit very slowly. And since the numerator decreases to a much greater extent than the denominator in the FEV1 to FVC formula, we can conclude that obstructive lung diseases are characterized by decreased ratio. Specifically, the FE1 to FVC ratio will be less than 70% most of the times. And this is not absolutely true because today, in, in this episode, we'll talk about the obstructive lung disease, specifically asthma, which is not characterized by the ratio of less than 70% unless the patient is in asthma attack. 
So what I'm trying to say is that the ratio of less than 70% suggests the obstructive lung diseases. However, it does not necessarily confirm the obstructive diseases and we need to do some additional testing as well. Let's move on to the restrictive lung diseases in the changes in FEV1 and the FVC. And let me ask you a question again. Zoosomalias, do you remember what we said about the pathophysiology of the restrictive diseases? Did we say that it's the problem with inhalation or is it the problem with exhalation? Mm -hmm. I hear you. Yes, it is the problem with inhalation. Alveoli cannot distend normally because of the increased lung elasticity and this is why the people with restrictive lung diseases cannot get enough air in their lungs. However, their exhalatory mechanics are normal. In other words, they can exhale the air normally. And in this sense, FEV1 will be decreased only slightly. And it will be decreased just because the person cannot inhale enough air, not because there is a problem during the exhalation. The same is true for the FVC. FVC will be slightly low, however, it won't be super dramatically decreased. And since both FEV1 and FVC decrease proportionately, then what do you guys think will happen to the FEV1 to FVC ratio? Are you telling me that it will that it will not change or it will get even higher? If you are, then you are totally right. Restrictive lung diseases are characterized by the FEV1 to FVC ratio of 70% or even higher. Because in severe restrictive diseases, the FVC actually decreases to a much greater extent than the FEV1. And this is when the ratio can become much higher than 70%. Okay, now we have talked about the changes in the respiratory volumes and the capacities in terms of the obstructive versus restrictive diseases, but what will happen to the flow volume loops? If you take a close look at the flow volume loop, you can hopefully appreciate that the normal loop is somewhere in the middle of the graph, right? And when we have obstructive lung diseases, the whole loop shifts towards the left side. In contrast, when we have the restrictive lung diseases, the whole loop, both exhalation and the inhalation, shifts towards the right side. And let's make the sense out of this, and then I'll tell you the mnemonic which I learned in um, my first or second year of med school, and I always remember this mnemonic in order to keep these flow volume loops fresh in my mind. Okay, first, the reason why flow volume loop is shifted leftward in obstructive lung diseases is that leftward shift indicates increased lung volumes. If you take a close look at the leftward shifted flow volume loop, you can see that the tidal volume is increased, uh, sorry, not the tidal volume, I'm sorry, the total lung capacity is increased and also the residual volume is increased. And the opposite will happen in case of the restrictive lung diseases where there is a rightward flow volume loop shift. And when there is a rightward shift, then there is a decrease in the lung volumes and capacities. There will be decrease in residual volume and in total lung capacity. Now that we have discussed the flow volume loops and the general characteristics of both obstructive and restrictive lung diseases, let's talk about each individual obstructive lung disease first. And we'll start with chronic bronchitis. Before we go to any further detail about chronic bronchitis, there is one thing that we should definitely know. Chronic bronchitis is a clinical diagnosis. In other words, there are specific 
diagnostic criteria that the patient should meet in order to be diagnosed with chronic bronchitis. And specifically, the patient should have productive cough for more than three months in a year for at least two consecutive years. And if the patient meets all of these criteria, then we can say that he or she has chronic bronchitis. Why does chronic bronchitis develop in the first place, right? The chronic bronchitis is a result of long-term smoking. Smoke inhalation induces reactive hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the mucus secreting glands in the submucosa of the bronchi. And when we have hypertrophic and hyperplastic mucus glands, then they secrete a lot of mucus in the bronchial lumen. And this mucus lines up the bronchial epithelium and it narrows down the bronchial lumen. And this is how we get the chronic bronchitis. It's very important to know the concept of right index for the USMLE step one. The right index is the ratio of the thickness of the mucosal gland layer to the thickness of the bronchial wall between the bronchial epithelium and the cartilage. And let me make this clear for you all guys. Right index does not contain epithelium and the bronchial cartilage in the denominator. Denominator involves all the layers of the bronchial wall except for the epithelium and the bronchial cartilage. And when this right index is more than 50%, this is when we can say with confidence that the patient has chronic bronchitis. Because the right index of more than 50%, 5-0, means that the thickness of mucosal gland layer is at least the half of the whole thickness of the bronchial wall. There is one very important physiologic concept which helps us differentiate the different obstructive and restrictive lung diseases from each other, and this is DLCO. DLCO is diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide. And DLCO shows us the ease of diffusion, how well the diffusion occurs through the alveoli. And if we recall the formula for diffusion, we know that the net diffusion equals to pressure gradient times surface area and times the uh, diffusion coefficient divided by thickness of the membrane times the size of the gas, right, molecular size. What I'm trying to say here is that in order for the respiratory disease to affect the DLCO, it needs to damage the alveoli in some ways. When we talk about chronic bronchitis, this is chronic bronchitis. In other words, this is the problem in bronchi and bronchioles, but it does not spread into the respiratory zone, meaning in the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. And here's my question to you guys. If chronic bronchitis does not usually affect the respiratory zone of the lungs, then what do you think will happen to DLCO? I hope you're telling me that DLCO will be normal. And if I remember correctly, normal DLCO is more than 80% of predicted. And sorry, I definitely needed to tell you the same for the FEV1 and FEVC separately. FEV, normal FEV1 is more than 80% of the predicted value and normal FEVC is also more than 80% of the predicted value. Okay, let's get back to the chronic bronchitis. What symptoms will the patient develop with chronic bronchitis? Well, since there is bronchial luminal narrowing due to all of those secretions, there will be wheezing. We will also have the crackles due to all of that secretion and the crackles will clear with the cough. This is a very important point not only for the chronic bronchitis but for any respiratory disease which increases the respiratory mucus secretion. When we hear the crackles 
And if the crackles clear after the patient coughs, it means that the crackles were, or the uh, crackles or either ronchi were caused by some kind of mucus that got cleared after the cough. The patient with chronic bronchitis will also have the cyanosis because when there is narrowing of the bronchial lumen due to all of those secretions, then there is less airflow inside the lungs and less oxygenation, right? One more thing. What do you guys think will happen to the resistance of the pulmonary vasculature in chronic bronchitis? Will it increase or will it decrease? I hope you're telling me that it will increase because in chronic bronchitis, we said that the patient has hypoxi like, uh, hypoxemia, right? Because the air cannot go down normally in the lungs, like insufficient air. And we know that low oxygen content causes hypoxic vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature in contrast to the, all the other capillary beds in the body. And therefore, we will have increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature. Okay, where are we going with this? When there is an increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature, which side of the heart will be affected? Is it right or is it left? Mm -hmm. That's right. It's right because, um, because the right heart, the right ventricle, pumps the blood directly into the lungs. And when we have hypoxic vasoconstriction throughout the whole lungs, then there will be concentric hypertrophy of the right ventricle and the patient might develop the condition called core pulmonale. Core pulmonale is an isolated right heart failure due to primary lung disease. And in most of the cases, the primary lung disease is a COPD, but it can be other diseases as well, including the rest uh, restrictive lung diseases. Okay, and the last thing that I need to tell you about chronic bronchitis is that we will have CO2 retention for sure because the air cannot be exhaled normally and we will have secondary polycythemia. Zoosemilears, do you think of a mechanism by which the chronic bronchitis patient will develop secondary polycythemia? Yes, that's right. When the patient has hypoxemia, then there is hypoxia or decreased oxygen delivery to the kidneys and the interstitial fibroblasts and the peritubular capillary beds will produce more EPO or erythropoietin and the EPO will then stimulate the bone marrow to make more and more RBCs. So uh, the polycythemia induced by either chronic bronchitis, emphysema or both called COPD will be classified as absolute appropriate polycythemia. This was discussion about the chronic bronchitis and now let's move on to emphysema. Emphysema is another obstructive lung disease and in contrast to chronic bronchitis, emphysema affects directly the respiratory zone of the lungs. In other words, it affects at least the respiratory bronchioles and it can also affect the alveoli. Therefore, we have two types of emphysema. We have centriacinar and the panacinar emphysema. First, let's de define the terms and then we'll get back to discussion of centriacinar versus panacinar emphysema. Acinus, or the lobule in lungs, is the same thing as the respiratory zone, consisting of respiratory bronchial, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. The center of the acinus is the respiratory bronchial and therefore when we say that there is centriacinar emphysema it means that there is damage to the central part of the acinus or respiratory bronchioles mostly right and it also the damage might be to the alveolar ducts as well the centriacinar emphysema does not usually affect the alveoli and centriacinar form of this disease is associated 
with smoking. This is why chronic bronchitis and centriazinar emphysema often coexist because both of them are caused by a long-term smoking history. And when chronic bronchitis and centriazinar emphysema are present at the same time, we call the disease chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. Centriacinar emphysema causes changes mostly in the upper lobes of both lungs. And the idea is that the cigarette smoke mostly goes in the upper lobes when it is inhaled in the lungs. Because the weight of the smoke is certainly very small, right? And the gravity does not have much effect on the cigarette smoke. And this is why the smoke goes mostly in the upper lungs and not in the lower lungs. In contrast, panacinar emphysema affects the whole acinus or the whole respiratory zone. This is what's called pan because pan means everything or all. Panacinar emphysema causes dilation of respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. Panacinar emphysema is mostly present in the lower lobes of the lungs in contrast to the centriacinar emphysema. And another very high yield thing to know about the panacinar emphysema is that it is usually caused by an inherited condition called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Let's step back a little bit and talk about the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. First off, what is the alpha-1 antitrypsin? Why is it called alpha-1 antitrypsin. It's called so because this protein is an alpha-1 globulin, which can be measured on the serum protein electrophoresis. And it's called antitrypsin because it is a protease. It degrades the proteins, including the enzymes, including trypsin. But then we discovered that it degrades not only trypsin, but the other enzymes one of which is neutrophil elastase. And please, let's pay attention to the fact that it degrades the elastase of specifically neutrophil, not of the macrophage. Uh, neutrophil elastase in the lungs has one function. It destroys the elastic fibers in the pulmonary interstitium. But normally, this function is inhibited by, <clears throat> excuse me, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Therefore, when the person has the normal levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin, then she or he has maintained the normal elastic fibers in the pulmonary interstitium, and his or her lungs have normal elasticity and compliance. But now let's talk about what happens in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Most of the times, mutation in these genes cause misfolding of the alpha-1 antitrypsin in the rough endoplasmic reticulum of the hepatocytes. And it means that the hepatocytes get filled up with this alpha-1 antitrypsin, and they can also lose their function meaning the person with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can develop not only COPD, but also liver failure, cirrhosis at a relatively young age. Since this is a genetic disease, the clinical manifestations become prominent at a relatively young age. A very high yield thing to know about the hepatic component of the uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is that if we hypothetically do the biopsy of the liver, what we'll find out is that there will be pink, purple, pus-positive globules in the liver. And these pus-positive globules, PAS-positive, sorry, are the aggregates of misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin. And it is pus-positive or periodic acid shift positive because PAS stain detects the glycoproteins, and the alpha-1 antitrypsin is a glycoprotein. Um, and the idea is that alpha-1 antitrypsin will be resistant to degradation by diastase, 
Diastase is an enzyme that breaks down the glycogen but not the glycoproteins. Why is this important? Where are we going with this? We are trying to say that pink purple globules on the hepatic biopsy can be seen in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency as well as glycogen storage diseases. Diseases like von Gerg disease, Pompe disease, Macardo, sorry, not Macardo, Macardo is the muscle problem, but all of these other glycogen storage diseases can show pink purple globules in the liver. How do we differentiate whether these globules consist of alpha-1 antitrypsin or the glycogen? By diastase. If pink purple globules disappear after application of diastase to the biopsy specimen, then it's most likely to be a glycogen storage disease. In contrast, if the globules do not disappear, then the component of the globules is resistant to the diastase and therefore it's more likely to be alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay, and the general clinical presentation of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a patient who develops the centriacinor, not centriacinor, panacinor emphysema, sorry, and liver failure at a relatively young age. Sometimes they might simplify the question stem even more and they might say that the patient has never smoked at all. And it's very unlikely to get the COPD in a non-smoker person, right? But even if the person has a very minor smoking history, it's very unlikely for the COPD to be induced by smoking. Let's say that we have a 30-year-old male who has a five-peck year smoking history and now presents with, uh, let's say, hypoxemia, presents with shortness of breath on exertion, and then he's diagnosed with panacinor emphysema and the liver failure. The five-peck year smoking history usually cannot cause the COPD. It needs the smoking history of several years to cause that kind of damage to the lungs. Okay, let's talk about the other clinical signs of the emphysema. First of all, they have the patients have barrel-shaped chest. And they have the barrel-shaped chest because anteroposterior chest diameter is increased. The idea here is that if there is air trapping in the lungs, that the lungs expand to a great extent. And if they expand, the thoracic cavity will expand, right? And if it expands, then the diameter from the sternum all the way to the thoracic vertebrae will be increased. This is why we say that AP diameter is increased and this is why we say that the patients with emphysema will have the barrel shaped chest. On the chest x-ray we will also see flattened diaphragm and this sign also arises from the air trapping in the lungs. When there is excessive air trapping, the lungs are over distended and they do not allow the diaphragm to elevate to its normal level. So the diaphragm stays low. And finally, on the chest x-ray, we'll also see increased lung lucency. In other words, the color of the lung tissue in a patient with COPD will be even darker on the chest x-ray than in a normal patient. And the idea here is that the COPD -er has an excessive amount of air and we know that the air has a very little density and this is why it looks black on the chest x-ray. And the lungs will be more black in case of the person with obstructive lung diseases. Inflammation in emphysema are mediated by three cells. They are CD8 positive T cells, macrophages, and the neutrophils. The final point worth mentioning about emphysema is that sometimes they are called pink puffers. They are called pink puffers because 
in the beginning of the disease, they manage to maintain the normal oxygen saturation and their skin color stays pink. This is why they are called pink. And they're called puffers because what they do is that during the exhalation, they purse their lips. It's called the pursed lip breathing. What's the idea behind pursed lip breathing? During the exhalation, the air exerts the tension on the bronchiole and bronchiolar walls. To say it in other words, the air drags the bronchial walls and the air tries to collapse those bronchial walls. Patients with emphysema already have a baseline obstruction during the exhalation, so they really don't want to have their bronchi and bronchioles collapse during the exhalation. When they purse their lips, they increase the resistance of the air to the airflow in the mouth cavity, and therefore they increase the back pressure in those bronchi and bronchioles, and this back pressure prevents the bronchial and bronchiolar collapse so that the airway is maintained patent throughout the whole exhalation. This is why they have the pursed lip breathing. And by the way, chronic bronchitis patients are sometimes called blue bloaters. They are called blue because they usually don't manage to maintain their saturation and they have cyanosis, as we already mentioned. And they are called bloaters because uh, mostly they, their, their BMI is, is usually large. We have now discussed both chronic bronchitis and emphysema, components of COPD. Let's now move on to asthma. Asthma is caused by hyperresponsive bronchi. In asthma, we have the certain allergen, which when inhaled, causes reactive bronchospasm, and this is when the patient's symptoms come into play. During the asthma, if we talk about the morphological findings, we have hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the bronchial smooth muscle. And we can imagine that if there is much more than normal amount of muscle around the bronchi, it causes the gradual narrowing of the bronchi, especially during, uh, during uh, exposure to the specific allergen. We've been talking about this allergen since we started talking about the asthma, and this should tell us the fact that asthma is mostly a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. However, this is not always true. There are certain triggers of asthma which are not mediated by the type 1 hypersensitivity. Here we will talk about the asthma which is classical, meaning which is caused by type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. The other common morphological findings characteristic of asthma is include the Kirschman spirals. Do you guys remember what the Kirschman spirals are? Kirschman spirals are these world masses on the biopsy of the patient's lungs indicating the shed epithelium from the asthmatic patient. The shed epithelium gets whirled in this mass and this mass is itself called Kirschman spiral and I would like to recommend that you Google the uh, images of the Kirschman spirals and just take a look at it because once you know how Kirschman spirals look like you most likely won't get it wrong on the actual exam. Another finding that I'd like to draw your attention to is Charcot-Leiden crystals. Charcot-Leiden crystals are those hexagonal double pointed crystals which are formed from the breakdown of the eosinophils in the sputum itself. Okay, guys, what do you think will happen to the DLCO in an asthmatic patient? Are you telling me that DLCO will be normal or even increased? If you are, then you are absolutely right. Asthma affects mostly bronchi. It does not usually affect the respiratory zone, which is com con uh, com 
<laughs> consisted of the respiratory bronchioles, sorry, and alveolar ducts and alveoli. Since the respiratory zone is spared in asthma, it means that the gas diffusion happens with the normal rate most of the times, and therefore DLCO will be normal, specifically more than 80% of the predicted for that patient. It might also be increased. And let's take a step back and talk about an increased DLCO in asthma. DLCO, or the diffusion rate for the gases in the alveoli, is dependent not only about the al is dependent not only on the alveolar characteristics, but also on the amount of blood that goes past this alveolus per unit time. If there is an increased amount of blood flow to the lungs, then DLCO will increase. In other words, there will be more oxygen diffusion across the alveolar membrane because there are more RBCs going to that specific alveolus per unit time. And therefore, there are more oxygen carrying tracks <laughs> going through this alveolus. And this is how DLCO might be increased in asthma. And I think I forgot to tell you about what happens to DLCO in emphysema. Since emphysema affects the respiratory zone, then accordingly, DLCO is most likely decreased. Okay, let's go back to asthma. How does asthma present? Asthmatic patient is usually asymptomatic at rest unless this is a severe asthma. And then when they are exposed to triggers like the different allergens, let's say pollen, or when they are stressed, or when they have the viral upper respiratory infections, this is when their symptoms start. And the symptoms arise from the reactive bronchospasm or bronchoconstriction. The patient will have wheezing, which is caused by small airway narrowing. The patient might also have a cough, tachypnea and dyspnea due to the bronchospasm. Asthmatic patient can even develop the hypoxemia if this is a severe bronchoconstriction because there will be less airflow and less oxygen flow into the lungs per unit time. Inspiratory to expiratory ratio will decrease. Let's talk about why this happens. When we first started discussing the obstructive lung diseases, we said that the problem in obstructive diseases is in expiration. They have a hard time exhaling the air. And this is exactly what happens in a patient with an asthma attack. Patient in an asthma attack has such a severe bronchospasm that they have a hard time exhaling the air. Therefore, the total time of the exhalation is increased in a patient with an asthma attack. And this is why inspiratory to expiratory ratio will decrease because the denominator increases. There will also be the mucus plugging because just like in chronic bronchitis, the mucus secretion is increased in asthma as well. And if there is a severe, severe attack, we might even get the pulses paradoxes in a patient. Zoosemilias, before we explain the mechanism of pulses paradoxes in the asthma attack, can you please remind me what the pulses, pulses paradoxes itself means? I hope you're telling me that pulses paradoxes is when the systolic blood pressure drops to drops by at least 10 millimeters of mercury during the inhalation. Now, why does this happen in severe asthma attack? Let's go step by step. When we have severe asthma attack, we have hypoxemia, just as we said several minutes ago, right? If we have hypoxemia, guys, what will happen to the vascular resistance in the lungs? Will it increase or will it decrease? Yes, it will increase. In other words, we will have reactive hypoxic vasoconstrictions, vasoconstriction throughout the lungs. Okay, if we have global pulmonary vasoconstriction due to hypoxia, what will happen to the afterload of the right ventricle? Are you saying that it will increase? If you are, then you are absolutely right. 
The afterload will increase for the right ventricle, therefore during the systole, when the right ventricle contracts, the interventricular septum might get deviated towards the left ventricle, and it will obstruct the subvalvular left ventricular outflow tract. If it obstructs the outflow tract, then the stroke volume will decrease dramatically during the inhalation, and this is when the systolic blood pressure will drop to by at least 10 millimeters of mercury. This is how severe asthma attack, and for all intents and purposes, severe pulmonary disease with resultant hypoxemia can cause pulses paradoxus. Pulses paradoxus can also occur in croup with the same mechanism. It can also occur in COPD with the same mechanism. How do we diagnose asthma? We diagnose the asthma by spirometry. We make the patient inhale at her or his full capacity and then we instruct them to exhale forcibly and we measure both FV1 and the FVC. However, we said that asthmatic patients are usually asymptomatic unless they are in the asthma attack. If they are in asthma attack, then we don't need to necessarily perform spirometry because it is usually evident that the patient has asthma attack and plus this is an emergency and we need to give the appropriate medications as soon as we can. But if the patient is asymptomatic and we do the spirometry, the patient might reveal the normal FEV1 to FVC ratio of more than 70%. But this does not exclude the asthma. We need to do the bronchoprovocation test if the spirometry results are inconclusive or indeterminate. And the bronchoprovocation test is can be done by the methacholine challenge. Guys, do you remember what methacholine is? What drug is methacholine? It's a muscarinic receptor agonist. So what will it do to the bronchial resistance in the patient's lungs? Will it increase the bronchial resistance or will it decrease the resistance? I hope you're telling me that it will increase the resistance because it will cause the bronchial, the, uh, bronchial bronchial constriction due to stimulating the muscarinic 3 receptors. Normally, when non-asthmatic patient inhales a very small dose of methacholine, yes, there is some minor bronchial constriction, but it's not severe enough to cause any kind of respiratory distress. In contrast, when an asthmatic patient inhales methacholine, their bronchi are so hypersensitive and so hyperreactive that even a very small dose of methacholine can induce significant bronchospasm and their respiratory distress. And this is how we can diagnose the asthma, but Honestly speaking, methacholine challenge test is not routinely performed due to its risks. You can imagine that the patient might go into a severe asthma attack by the methacholine itself. The final topic in the subsection of asthma that I'd like to discuss with you guys is NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease. NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease is a combination of several signs and symptoms. First of all, it is characterized, characterized by the asthma. And let's talk about the pathophysiology of bronchoconstriction in the NSAID induced, NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease or NERD. When we give the patient an NSAID, what will happen to the prostaglandin production, guys? I hope you're telling me that it will decrease because NSAIDs inhibit either reversibly or irreversibly the enzyme called cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenases are responsible for prostaglandin production, so if we block the cyclooxygenases, then arachidonic acid can no longer be converted into the prostaglandins. How does this relate to the bronchoconstriction? We know that arachidonic acid is an initial substrate for prostaglandin production as well as for leukotriene production. 
And if the cyclooxygenase pathway is blocked after NSAID administration, then where do you think this, this arachidonic acid will go? It will go to the leukotriene pathway. And the 5 lipooxygenase will convert the arachidonic acid into the different leukotrienes. And we should know that leukotriene C4, D4, and E4 can cause bronchoconstriction in addition to vasoconstriction and increased vascular permeability. And this is how NSAIDs can induce asthmatic bronchoconstriction. At the same time, NSAID-exacerbated respiratory disease is usually characterized by the nasal polyps and the chronic sinusitis. And yes, we, we already talked about the asthma symptoms. We're done with the asthma, and let's move on to the last obstructive disease that we're going to talk about, and this is bronchiectasia or bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is permanently dilated bronchi due to recurrent lung infections. The name itself gives away the main pathological finding of this disease. Bronchi means bronchi, right? And ectasia or ectasis means dilation. Bronchiectasis literally means bronchial dilation. In this case, there is a self-perpetuous cycle of infection and repair. Infection and repair. In other words, there is the pulmonary infection, which causes the inflammatory infiltrate in the bronchi, and all of those neutrophils with their lysosomal enzymes and the reactive oxygen species destroy not only the invading pathogen, but also the bronchial walls. And when they destroy the cartilage to a certain extent, then the cartilage can no longer maintain the normal shape and size of the bronchi. And this is why the bronchi dilate. When the bronchi dilate, then all of those, those secretions accumulate in the dilated part. And when we have the stasis of any type of secretion of the fluid, then the bacteria can secondarily overgrow in that fluid. It causes a repeated bacterial infection, and that bacterial infection will result in a second episode of repair, which will further damage the already dilated bronchi. And you can imagine how this is a self-perpetuous cycle. All of that secretion is purulent because of bacterial overgrowth, and this is what the main complaint and the symptom of the patients with bronchiectasis is. They have a massive amount of the purulent sputum produced per day. They might be producing like cups and buckets of the uh, purulent sputum. Very commonly, patients with bronchiectasis have chronic lung infections with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And there is a very high yield microbiological concept behind this fact. Can you guys tell me logically why the patient with bronchiectasis is predisposed to Pseudomonas infection? Let me remind you that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is one of several bacteria that can form the biofilm after the quorum sensing. In other words, when the bacterial count in a specific surface area reaches the certain extent, this is when bacteria starts to make a biofilm, which is a very large polysaccharide mass, and biofilm protects bacteria from the external noxious stimuli and even antibiotics, so they can colonize the respiratory tract chronically and they can cause recurrent infections. And this is how Pseudomonas aeruginosa can be a very common causative agent of bronchiectasis and the attacks of the bronchiectasis. The patients might also get the hemoptysis because the bronchial wall damage results in the damage of the peribronchial vessels as well. And finally, we might have digital clubbing due to hypoxia-induced activation of the platelets and megakaryocytes, which then produce the growth factors like PDGF, 
in the periphery and this is what causes the soft tissue hyperplasia mostly in the hands and this is how we get the digital clotting. We already mentioned that bronchiectasis is caused by the chronic infection which is a necrotizing infection of the bronchi and then we have permanently dilated airways. What is very high yield about bronchiectasis is to know the associated conditions with it. And before we talk about the details, we can deduce that infections that can cause chronic lung, uh, sorry, diseases that can cause chronic lung infections are commonly associated with bronchiectasis. The first one that I'll, I'd like to talk to you about, guys, is Carter Jenner syndrome. We will not go into much detail about Carter Jenner syndrome because it will be covered in other episodes. However, we should still mention the fact that Carter Jenner syndrome is characterized by autosomal recessive defect in the axonemal dynein arm. And it means that the cilia can no longer beat, and all of those mucus and bacteria accumulate in one place and they cause the chronic infections. Even the tobacco smoking without any inherited condition can induce bronchiectasis in rare cases. And the idea here is that tobacco itself can cause ciliostasis. In other words, it can stop cilia from beating. And once we just disrupt the mucociliary escalator mechanism, then the bacteria can overgrow in the bronchi. Additionally, I think the disease that I'm going to mention right now came into your mind right after I mentioned the bronchiectasis. And this is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis patients have a very, very thick mucus in their lungs and in their GI tract. And this thick mucus is very hard to expectorate. Therefore, it stays in the lungs. And when it stays in the bronchi, then the bacteria can overgrow in them, especially Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Staph aureus, depending on the age. And the patient will get chronic lung infections complicated by bronchiectasis. And the final condition associated with bronchiectasis is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. ABPA is an allergic reaction which is a mix of type 1 and type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. It usually happens either in asthmatic patients or the ones with cystic fibrosis and this is an allergic reaction to the aspergillus spores which are inhaled. This allergic reaction can also cause the bronchial dilation and therefore the bronchiectasis. And this is how we wrapped up the obstructive lung diseases. So now we'll move on to the restrictive diseases. Let's just recall what we have already discussed very extensively in the beginning of this episode and then we will discuss the individual restrictive lung diseases and the mechanics behind them. We said earlier that restrictive lung diseases have the problem during inhalation because there is a certain extent of interstitial pulmonary fibrosis and this increases the lung elasticity. In other words, it becomes hard to distend the lungs during the inhalation and this is why the patients with restrictive lung diseases have very short and the shallow breaths. Restrictive lung diseases can be caused by problems of the lung parenchyma itself. So this is when we call it diffuse parenchymal lung disease or interstitial lung disease. But at the same time, restrictive lung diseases can be caused by changed respiratory mechanics, which is usually related with the problems of the thoracic wall or the patient's weight. And now we'll discuss how to differentiate these two subgroups of the restrictive lung diseases. Two parameters which can differentiate whether the restrictive lung disease is due to altered respiratory mechanics or due to diffuse parenchymal lung disease are DLCO and the AA gradient. We have discussed both of them in our physiology and pathology series, 
but once again, let's remind ourselves very briefly what each of them means. DLCO is a surrogate marker for the diffusion capacity of the alveoli, how easily the gases can diffuse across the alveolar wall, while AA gradient, which is alveolar arterial gradient, is the difference between alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. And usually the AA gradient is quite low, but it can be increased in diffuse, not diffuse, but the lung parenchyma diseases. First, we'll talk about the altered respiratory mechanics. Let's say that the patient has respiratory muscle weakness. In that case, the patient cannot contract the diaphragm sufficiently. And if she or he cannot contract the diaphragm sufficiently, it means that the inhalation will be uh, affected, right? And the patient will have problem while inhaling the air. However, during the respiratory muscle weakness, there is no problems within the lungs itself. The lungs are clear, the lungs are healthy. Alveolar wall and the diffusion membrane is normal, and therefore DLCO will stay normal. And the AA gradient will also stay normal because since there is no interstitial fibrotic changes in case of the weak respiratory muscles, there will be normal diffusion of both CO2 and also the oxygen, which will maintain normal DLCO and the AA gradient. What can cause the respiratory muscle weakness? There are many, many different causes that we can talk about, and this will take us away uh, on, a, on a very long discussion. So we'll just mention these diseases with a brief explanation of how they can cause the respiratory um, uh, restrictive lung disease. Sorry. Myasthenia gravis can be one possible cause of restricted lung disease. As we know, myasthenia gravis... Okay, let me ask this rather than tell you this. Guys, do you remember the pathophysiology of the myasthenia gravis? I hope you're telling me that myasthenia gravis is caused by antibodies against the nicotinic muscle receptors on the motor end plate, which causes the muscle weakness. And muscle weakness is usually decremental, meaning it decreases with time. We also know that the diaphragm is the muscle, just like any other skeletal muscle, and the diaphragm can also become fatigued in case of myasthenia gravis, and this is how it can cause restrictive lung disease. Let's take Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is demyelination due to autoimmune inflammation after either GI or GU infection, right? And it can demyelinate the phrenic nerve as well, which innervates the diaphragm. If we demyelinate the phrenic nerve, then we will disrupt the saltatory fast conduction through the phrenic nerve, and therefore we will decrease the diaphragmatic contractions. Let's talk about how spinal cord damage can induce restrictive lung disease. Let's take polio. Poliovirus can cause poliomyelitis, which damages the anterior horns of the spinal cord. So, Wes Emilius, do you remember what type of motor neuron is placed in the anterior spinal cord horns? Are you telling to me that this is a lower motor neuron? If you are, you're right. The ventral horns, or the anterior horns, contain the lower motor neurons, which innervate all the skeletal muscles in our body, including the diaphragm. If poliomyelitis causes damage of the lower motor neurons, or alpha motor neurons, at the C3, C4, and C5 spinal cord segments, it means that the phrenic nerves will no longer conduct the electronic signal to the diaphragm, and the diaphragmatic contraction can stop, and this is how the patient can develop the respiratory failure while having the polio. This is the most feared complication of poliomyelitis, and the patients might need to get intubated and be on the ventilator support for a very long time. 
ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, can also cause restrictive lung disease. And the mechanism here is almost the same as in case of polio. We know that ALS damages both upper and lower motor neurons, meaning both corticospinal tract and the anterior horns. And since it damages the anterior horns, it can cause the diaphragmatic dysfunction. Okay, let's now talk about the chest wall abnormalities that can cause the restrictive lung disease with the normal DLCO and AA gradient. These abnormalities include scoliosis. When the patient has scoliosis, then there is the displacement of the vertebral column in the coronal plane and it causes compression of a unilateral lung. So one of the lungs cannot expand normally and this is how the patient can have short shallow breaths in case of the scoliosis. But once again, scoliosis does not cause the damage to the lung parenchyma itself, which will result in normal DLCO and the AA gradient. The patient who has severe, severe obesity, let's say if we have class 2 obesity, meaning BMI from 35 to 39.9, or even morbid obesity, which is BMI at least 40, then the patient might develop the syndrome called Pickwickian syndrome. And Pickwickian syndrome is also known as obesity hypomentilation syndrome when the excessive fat on the chest wall is hard to pull during the inhalation. And these patients have very, very shallow breaths, which is characteristic of the restrictive lung disease. Now let's move on to diffuse parenchymal lung diseases or DPLDs. This is a new term. And it has replaced, almost replaced, the term interstitial fibrosis or interstitial lung disease. However, some of us still use them interchangeably. And now that we already have the damage of the lung parenchyma, then DLCO will be decreased and AA gradient will be increased because the gas diffusion is now impaired, mostly due to increased thickness of the diffusion barrier. And the thickness increases due to collagen deposition in the pulmonary interstitium. Very classic restrictive lung diseases due to lung parenchymal disease are pneumoconioses and we will discuss all of these in today's episode. So let's not stop in them and continue listing these conditions. Sarcoidosis can also cause interstitial lung disease due to the granuloma formation and interstitial fibrosis. We might have interstitial fibrosis, which is idiopathic, and accordingly we call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. Certain types of vasculitides can also cause restrictive lung diseases. And here we talk about granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or GPA, which was previously known as the Wegener's disease, and we might also have the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis or Schirk-Strauss disease. However, Schirk-Strauss disease commonly causes asthma. Therefore, it's probably better to remember that Schirk-Strauss disease mostly causes obstructive lung disease, while Wegener's can cause mostly restrictive lung disease. Let me remind you a tumor called hematologic malignancy called Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which is the malignancy of the Langerhans cells, right? And we might also have the pulmonary involvement here, especially in the subtype called eosinophilic granuloma. And eosinophilic granuloma can also cause the restrictive lung disease. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is another common cause Drug-induced lung toxicity is extremely high yield for boards for both step one and step two. And we should know all the drugs, well, not all, because there are probably many drugs that can cause pulmonary toxicity, but we should know the main drugs that induce interstitial 
fibrosis. Uh, this is methotrexate, also busulfan and bleomycin can cause it, uh, nitrofurantoin, carmistin, lomustin, those drugs can definitely cause the lung toxicity. Acute respiratory distress syndrome is also considered to be the restrictive lung disease because in that case, the surfactant is washed out from the alveolar surface. Here's a question for you guys. If surfactant is washed out in the ARDS, then what will happen to the surface tension? Surface tension will increase because surfactant normally decreases surface tension. If surface tension decreases, then collapsing pressure increases, right? Because increase in surface tension increases the uh, collapsing pressure and it will increase the lung elasticity. So we can consider ARDS as just one subtype of the restrictive lung diseases. The final condition that I'd like to list in the in, in this subsection is radiation induced lung injury, which is divided into acute radiation pneumonitis and the radiation fibrosis. You can intuitively understand that acute radiation pneumonitis is an acute phase of radiation induced lung injury while radiation fibrosis is a chronic phase because fibrosis, that is collagen deposition, always needs time. It doesn't happen in a day or in a week. It happens over the course of weeks and months. Radiation induced lung injury is the lung injury due to excessive radiation, for example, due to excessive CT scans, chest x-ray, and so on. And that radiation creates the reactive oxygen species, especially hydroxyl radical. And those reactive oxygen species then induce pro-inflammatory cytokine release. The major cytokines implicated in the pathogenesis of radiation-induced lung injury are TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, and interleukin-1. Radiation-induced lung injury might be totally asymptomatic, but if it does develop symptoms, then the patient will manifest the dry cough and shortness of breath. If there is any fever, then the fever will be low grade. As we already mentioned, acute radiation pneumonitis happens within several weeks, approximately 4 to 12 weeks, and radi acute radiation pneumonitis is also called the exudative phase because this is an acute inflammatory state with exudate. But then radiation fibrosis happens months after the excessive radiation exposure. It might happen anywhere from 6 to 12 months. Let's start the individual discussion of the RLDs with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or the IPF. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is exactly what it says. This is interstitial fibrosis of the lung with no known cause or idiopathic. And IPF usually is caused by the self perpetuous cycle of injury and repair injury and repair so there is lung injury due to an unknown stimulus which causes inflammation and fibrosis and if there is repeated exposure to that stimulus then there will be repeated cycles of injury inflammation fibrosis injury inflammation fibrosis and so on there are certain triggers which are hypothesized to cause the ipf one of them is cigarette smoking, and I'd like to take a step back a little bit and talk about this because it, it's very high old to know. Most of us, when thinking about cigarette smoking, think about COPD because we know that cigarette smoking mostly causes obstructive lung disease called COPD. However, we should also keep in mind that cigarette smoking can induce the restrictive lung disease, for example, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. IPF can also be caused by the unknown genetic defects or the other environmental pollutants. And the findings will not be different from those seen in the other restrictive lung diseases. The person will have a progressive shortness of breath, then there will be a 
uh, fatigue due to chronic hypoxia, non-productive cough uh, due to irritation of the J receptors or juxtacapillary receptors in the pulmonary interstitium due to that pulmonary fibrosis. And we can also hear the crackles or the dry rails, which will be end inspiratory rails. And this is because the alveoli open up or pop up in those fibrotic interstitium. On the imaging, either on the chest x-ray, but mostly on the high resolution chest CT, we will see the reticular opacities. The reticular opacities are those whitish linear streaks and they might extend all the way to the lung periphery in case of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. IPF can also cause the bronchiectasis and the idea here is that when there is excessive fibrosis of the pulmonary interstitium, all of that collagen induces or exerts a traction or tractive force on the bronchi. It tries to dilate the bronchi and when there is excessive collagen deposition in the interstitium, then bronchi lose their shape, they get dilated and the person might have IPF complicated by bronchiectasis and in that case, we can imagine that the patient will have a combination of obstructive and restrictive lung diseases. Honeycomb, honeycomb appearance that is very classic for interstitial fibrosis happens only in advanced diseases. Now, what are the complications of the IPF? First, when we have interstitial pulmonary fibrosis to any cause, including IPF, we have global hypoxic vasoconstriction in the lungs and hypoxic vasoconstriction of the pulmonary vasculature can certainly induce pulmonary hypertension. Okay, then if we get the pulmonary hypertension, then another complication that might follow the pulmonary hypertension is corpulmonale. And we have already talked about how this, how this happens, right? When we were discussing the chronic bronchitis in this episode, we said that hypoxic vasoconstriction increases the afterload for right ventricle, which then becomes eccentrically hypertrophied, and this causes the corpulmonale. Respiratory failure or the lung cancer can occur in, in the IPF. And finally, we might also have the arrhythmias due to hypoxia and due to concentric right ventricular hypertrophy. Let's move on to hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is hypersensitivity reaction due to some kind of inhaled allergen. And this is a mixed type of the hypersensitivity reaction. It consists of both type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And this is very high yield to answer the questions that ask the pathophysiology of the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. They might ask, what is, which of the following components of the immune system is involved in the pathogenesis of this patient's disease? And if we know that HP is caused by both type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity, then we can answer this question and we can say that both immune complexes from type 3 hypersensitivity and the T cells from type 4 hypersensitivity contribute to the development of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now, what are those allergens that can cause this hypersensitivity reaction? There are many, many, many different allergens. Most commonly, these are the fungal spores and the molds. So it's very common in farmers, also the bird fanciers, because uh, if the person inhales the uh, so some bird excrements, for example, it can also cause the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And hypersensitivity pneumonitis in bird fanciers is accordingly called bird fanciers lungs. HP can be very acute. When the person is exposed to that allergen, then she or he will acutely start to have shortness of breath and cough. There might be some fever with chest tightness and the headache. And since hypersensitivity pneumonitis is directly related to the person's exposure to that allergen, then removal of that allergen from the environment 
resolves the hypersensitivity in Imonetis. However, it's not always possible, right? For example, if the person is a farmer and this is his or her occupation, then it's very hard to remove a specific allergen, let's say the fungal spore or mold, from his or her environment. And uh, if the person is chronically exposed to that particle and the allergen, then hypersensitivity pneumonitis can be complicated by the irreversible fibrosis accompanied by non-caseating or non-necrotizing granulomas. Well, granulomas are formed by the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, right? At the same time, interstitial fibrosis will cause the thickening of the alveolar septae and traction bronchiectasis with the same mechanism that we already discussed for the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Before we move any further, the thing that I forgot to tell you about the IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, is the new treatment options. Generally, we know that fibrosis is mostly irreversible. We cannot take out the collagen that is already deposited in the tissue. However, we can prevent the further fibrosis of the tissue. And we have two drugs for this. One of them is called perfenidone. Perfenidone inhibits TGF-beta. And we know that TGF-beta is a fibrotic growth factor. It causes the activation of the fibroblasts and the collagen deposition. Another drug is nintedanib. Nintedanib is the inhibitor of the tyrosine kinase domains of the PDGF, FGF, and EGF receptors. These three growth factors, platelet-derived growth factor, epidermal growth factor, and the fibroblast growth factor, can all induce a certain extent of fibrosis, and this is how nintedanib prevents that pathway. Let's now move on to sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is an autoimmune condition characterized by formation of non-caseating granulomas in potentially any organ system. The most commonly involved organs in the sarcoidosis are the lungs. However, it, it can occur literally anywhere. For example, the non-caseating granulomas from the sarcoid can even occur in the hypothalamus or the pituitary, which can cause generalized or uh, the yeah generalized or focal hypopituitarism. Sarcoidosis is also characterized by elevated levels of the ACE in the blood or angiotensin converting enzyme. However, I would like to tell you that elevated ACE levels is not specific for sarcoidosis. And this means that when we read that the patient's ACE level is elevated in the plasma, it does not confirm sarcoidosis. So don't fall into the premature closure bias by reading the elevated ACE levels. If we do the bronchoalveolar lavage on the patient with the pulmonary sarcoidosis, what we'll find out in the lavage fluid is that the CD4 to CD8 ratio is increased. In other words, the amount of CD4 T cells in the bronchial fluid is higher compared to the amount of CD8 T cells. And this also makes sense because, as we already mentioned, sarcoidosis is characterized by non-caseating granuloma formation. And we know that granulomas are formed by epithelioid histiocytes which are transformed macrophages. But what causes the macrophage transformation into the epithelial histiocyte. That's the T helper 1 cell. And this is why CD4 T cells are more predominant compared to the CD8 T cells. In terms of epidemiology, sarcoid is more common in the black population, especially black females. And from the symptomatology standpoint, sarcoid might last for many years asymptomatically, but when it becomes clinically manifested, it can have the symptoms in many, many different organ systems. But before that, let's talk about the imaging findings in sarcoid, in pulmonary sarcoid. If we have pulmonary sarcoidosis, a very, very characteristic finding is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy.
If you look at the chest x-ray or the chest CT of a someone with sarcoidosis, you will see that there are enlargements of both sides of the mediastinum and this is due to hilar lymphadenopathy, which is very commonly mentioned in the question stem because it's very prevalent in the sarcoid patients. However, other than the other than the hilar lymphadenopathy, they also might have the reticular opacities in the lungs, which denote the interstitial fibrosis. In the first place, why are we discussing sarcoid in the subsection of the restrictive lung diseases? Because it can cause restrictive lung disease due to pulmonary interstitial fibrosis. Since we started talking about the symptoms of the sarcoid, let's talk about the symptoms and signs in the other organ systems. Sarcoid can also cause peripheral facial nerve palsy or the Bell's palsy. It can be manifested as uveitis as well. Guys, do you remember what uveitis is? I hope you're telling me that uveitis is the inflammation of the middle layer of the eye, which is also called uvea. We mentioned that sarcoid is characterized by granulomas, but what we have not said yet is that Granulomas might include very specific findings like shaman or asteroid bodies. And shaman body is the concentric concretion of the calcification, while asteroid body is the concretion looking like an asteroid or the star. I would really like to recommend that you Google the photos of both shaman and the asteroid bodies. And believe me, you will never forget their appearance once you have seen it at least once. Additional clinical finding characteristic of sarcoidosis is lupus perneo. Lupus perneo is the skin lesions which look like the rash in the lupus. The patient with sarcoid might have the malar rash, which is associated mostly with lupus or, say, dermatomyositis. Also, the other type of rash can occur in sarcoid. We have already talked about the interstitial fibrosis. And we should also mention that patients with sarcoidosis might develop something called erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum is septal paniculitis. Paniculitis is the inflammation of the subcutaneous fat, meaning the fat immediately below the dermis. And it manifests mostly on the, mostly on the anterior shins as the red tender bumps or the nodules. Patients with sarcoid might also e exhibit the rheumatoid arthritis-like arthropathy, and finally, they might have hypercalcemia with its complications. And here, let's stop, take a step back, and talk about the hypercalcemia. Guys, do you know or do you remember why patients with sarcoidosis might have hypercalcemia? absolutely crazy crazy amazing yeah that's right this is when non-caseating granulomas and the epithelioid histiocytes exhibit in increased activity of the 1 alpha hydroxylase and we know that 1 alpha hydroxylase converts calcidiol or 25 hydroxy d3 to calcitriol the active form of the vitamin d and then active form of vitamin D causes increased calcium and phosphate absorption from the GI tract and this is how the patients with sarcoidosis might get hypercalcemia with all the complications that we know of about hypercalcemia like increased urination, increased thirst, there might be uh, other findings like psychiatric disturbances, kidney stones, abdominal pain and so on. Finally, how do we treat sarcoidosis? First off, we should mention that we treat sarcoidosis only if it's symptomatic. If it's not symptomatic, then it's not worth treating the patient because we don't have a targeted therapy for the sarcoidosis. We usually treat it with the steroids, and we know that steroids have a myriad of the side effects. So if patient is completely asymptomatic and is accidentally diagnosed with sarcoidosis, it's definitely better to have him or her diagnosed with an asymptomatic sarcoidosis rather than to start treatment with steroids and then uh, seeing him or her uh, 
with uh, steroid-induced Cushing syndrome. And this is how we wrapped up sarcoidosis, and let's move on to pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconioses are the cluster of restrictive lung diseases which are mostly related to the occupational exposure to the certain stimulus. There are four pneumoconioses that we should know. This is asbestos-related disease, borreliosis, coal workers pneumoconiosis, and finally we have silicosis. Let's start with asbestos-related disease. Previously we had the term asbestosis, however now we say that we have asbestos-related diseases because exposure to asbestos can cause several different conditions in the lungs. It can cause asbestosis, which literally means intrapulmonary interstitial fibrosis, but it can also cause pleural disease and the cancer. Asbestos exposure is really common in the shipbuilding industry, also in the roofing, because asbestos was previously used in the insulation, so construction workers might be exposed to asbestos and plumbers can also be exposed to asbestos because asbestos can be also used in the pipes. Absolutely pathognomonic findings for asbestos related disease are these ivory white supradiaphragmatic and the pleural plaques. In other words these are the plaques which are dystrophically calcified and they can occur on both visceral pleura, parietal pleura, but it can also occur on the uh, superior part of the diaphragm. And this is totally pathognomonic. In other words, if we see the pleural or the supradiaphragmatic plaques on the patient's autopsy or let's say the chest CT, we can say that this patient has asbestos related disease. As we already mentioned in the beginning of this discussion, asbestos can cause cancer in the lungs. And it can cause two types of cancers, either bronchogenic carcinoma or mesothelioma. And we'll talk about mesothelioma um, as the last topic in today's episode. But before that, let's mention a very high yield fact about asbestos. Asbestos causes a much higher risk of bronchogenic carcinoma than that of mesothelioma. And this is very important to know because the question might ask, which of the following is this patient most likely to develop, let's say, in the next 10 years or 20 years? And I almost guarantee that both of these options will be written separately, bronchogenic carcinoma and mesothelioma. And we should note that bronchogenic carcinoma is much more common simply because Development of mesothelioma needs much more time and much longer exposure to the asbestos. The asbestos-related diseases are also a culprit of another condition called Kaplan syndrome. Kaplan syndrome is written as C in this case, so Kaplan. And Kaplan syndrome is the simultaneous presence of rheumatoid arthritis and any type of pneumoconiosis. What I'm trying to tell you, Zoosemilius, is that Kaplan syndrome is not a complication specific to asbestosis. It can occur in any other pneumoconiosis if it's present simultaneously with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and these two conditions will cause the intrapulmonary nodules. We should remember that asbestos affects the lower lobes of the lungs and also the diaphragm, right? And if we hypothetically perform the lung biopsy of the patient with asbestosis, then we'll see asbestos bodies or ferruginous bodies. These are these dumbbell-shaped long rods, which are composed of the asbestos and also the iron. And they are uh, they are basically obtained by the bronchoalveolar lavage. Sorry, I mentioned lung biopsy, but I should have said bronchoalveolar lavage, and we should stain the lavage fluid with Prussian blue stain because 
If you remember, Prussian blue stains the iron. Ferruginous bodies are iron-containing asbestos bodies, and therefore they can be stained with Prussian blue stain. And the final point that it's worth mentioning here is that asbestos-related diseases increase the risk for pleural effusions. In this case, we mean that either mesothelioma or the pleural disease can cause the pleural effusions. Let's move on to borreliosis. Borreliosis, in contrast to asbestosis, affects the upper lobes. And in general, let's take a step back and let me give you one very helpful mnemonic, which is the mnemonic from the first aid, uh, that I always remember to keep the location of these pneumoconioses fresh. Asbestos is from the top, meaning from the roof, because it was used in insulation, but it affects the base, base of the lungs, meaning the lower lobes. All the other three pneumoconioses, which is silica, coal, and the beryllium, all of them are from the base, meaning earth, but they affect the roof of the lungs, or the upper lobes. Now let's continue, and let's reiterate that borreliosis affects the upper lobes. Borreliosis is the interstitial fibrosis caused by exposure to beryllium. Now, when does the patient get exposed to beryllium? It's very common in the aerospace industry, and it's also common in the manufacturing industries. For example, dentistry and the dentists are commonly exposed to beryllium. Berylliosis is a granulomatous disease and it causes non-caseating or non-necrotizing granulomas. Since it's a granulomatous disease, it is sometimes responsive to the steroids because steroids inhibit the T-cells, mostly, and therefore they can just dial down the development of the granulomas. And just like we talked about the asbestosis, borreliosis also increases the risk of cancer, and it also increases the risk for core pulmonale. Guys, from our today's discussion, do you remember the definition of core pulmonale? I hope you do, and I hope that you're telling me that core pulmonale is isolated heart, right heart failure due to primary lung disease. And in this case, primary lung disease is either berylliosis or asbestosis or any other pneumoconiosis. Let's move on to coal workers' pneumoconiosis. And I guess the name here itself is pretty much self-explanatory. This is pneumoconiosis, which commonly occurs in the coal workers, because in coal, there is exposure to the coal dust, which gets inhaled. And this dust and the carbon particles get phagocytosed by the alveolar macrophages and then we have those macrophages laden with the carbon and carbon laden macrophages look black on the tissue this is why we call coal workers pneumoconiosis the black lung disease because it makes the lungs literally black just like we mentioned about the asbestos the coal worker's pneumoconiosis also increases the risk for the Kaplan syndrome. Coal worker's pneumoconiosis also affects the upper lobes, and what we'll see on the imaging, either chest X or chest CT, is the small nodular opacities diffusely in the lungs, especially in the upper lobes. What is more high yield to mention, together with the coal worker's pneumoconiosis, is the benign asymptomatic variant of this condition, which is called anthracosis. Anthracosis, once again, is an asymptomatic form of coal workers' pneumoconiosis. And it's very common in people who live in big cities where there is a lot of sooty air from all of that like fumes and the car smoke. An inhalation of that air chronically over the course of years can also cause deposition of carbon in the alveolar macrophages, but in contrast to coal workers pneumoconiosis, the concentration of that soot in the air is not high enough to cause the symptomatic pneumoconiosis.
And the final pneumoconiosis that we should discuss here is silicosis. And just as we did for the other pneumoconiosis, let's first talk about the occupations which might cause potential exposure to silica or quartz. Silicosis commonly occurs in sand blasters. These are people who clean the different surfaces with a very high pressure of the sand wave. It, silicosis is also prevalent in people who work in foundries or in the mines. When silica is inhaled, it also gets phagocytosed by the alveolar macrophages. And then those alveolar macrophages release the fibrotic growth factors like TGF-beta, which causes interstitial fibrosis. Here we go. Here we are now going to discuss probably the highest deal point about silicosis. Silicosis increases the risk for tuberculosis. And we should also know the mechanism behind this concept. It's hypothesized that inhaled silica, which is phagocytosed inside the macrophages, inhibits the fusion of the phagosome and lysosome. To put it in other words, silica inhibits the formation of the phagolysosome. Now, here's the question for you guys. What kind of bacteria is mycobacterium? Is it intracellular or is it extracellular? I hope you're telling me that it's a facultative intracellular bacterium and macrophages should phagocytose the mycobacterium rods and then they need to expose those bacilli to the lysosomal enzymes to somehow kill it. If the phagolysosome fusion doesn't happen, then even if macrophages phagocytose the tuberculosis bacilli, they won't be able to get rid of it and the patient will get infected with TB easier than someone without silicosis. Silica also increases the risk of the cancer called pulmonale and the Kaplan syndrome, the conditions that we already talked about while discussing the other pneumoconiosis. It also affects the upper lobes, just like berylliosis and the co-workers pneumoconiosis. And silicosis, very importantly, causes the eggshell calcifications of the hyalur lymph nodes. Eggshell calcifications means that the rim or the margin of those hyalur lymph nodes are calcified. They look whiter than the center of those lymph nodes. And this was discussion about silicosis. So let's move on to the last topic of our today's episode, which is mesothelioma. Mesothelioma, just thinking about the name, is the tumor of the mesothelium. Mesothelial cells are the cells which line the body cavities. They line the pleural cavity, pericardial, and peritoneal cavities. But mesothelioma usually develops in the pleural cavity, and as we already mentioned while discussing the pneumoconiosis, the single most important well-documented risk factor for mesothelioma is, that's right, asbestosis. Mesothelioma causes thickening of the mesothelium, which definitely inhibits the normal lung expansion. So the patient with mesothelioma can present with unilateral shortness of breath, especially during the inhalation. And not only the thickness of the malignant mesothelium, but the pleural effusion itself caused by the mesothelioma can cause inability of the lungs to expand. Pleural effusion in case of mesothelioma is usually, um, it, it's actually for most of the times because we know that uh, tumors and cancers usually cause the exudate, but at the same time mesotheliomas cause hemorrhagic pleural effusion very commonly. When you read the hemorrhagic pleural effusion in the question stem, please think about some kind of malignant process or tuberculosis in the lungs. And one of those malignant processes might be the mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is one of several 
tumors which are characterized by somoma bodies. Somoma bodies, let me remind you, are the concentric calcifications in a world pattern. If we do electron microscopy of the cells taken from the mesothelioma, what we'll see is that these cells will have short, plump microvilli. They will be connected to each other via desmosomes, and they will have tonofilaments as their intermediate filaments. There are two very high yield markers for mesothelioma which are absent in the carcinomas and therefore these markers help us differentiate mesothelioma from carcinoma in, in the pleural cavity. Mesotheliomas are commonly positive for cal retinin and cytokeratin 5-6. So it's cal retinin and cytokeratin 5-6. If these two markers are positive then it suggests mesothelioma. If they are negative, then it suggests carcinoma rather than mesothelioma. And it's very important to know that smoking is not a risk factor for mesothelioma. And this is a very important point because we, most of us tend to think that, and, and it's right, definitely right, that smoking is the number one risk factor for the lung cancers. But that cannot be extrapolated to all the cancers in the thoracic cavity. Yes, if we are talking about the lung cancers, then we are right. Smoking is the number one risk factor for the lung cancers, but mesothelioma is not the cancer of the lung. It's the cancer of the mesothelium, and the risk factor for it is asbestos-related diseases. We have come to an end of our today's discussion, and let's summarize everything that we have discussed today. In this episode, we discussed the flow volume loops, obstructive lung diseases, and finally, restrictive lung diseases. We should know their clinical features, and most importantly, we should know the pathophysiology that we have emphasized in our today's episode. You can leave the voice message on this episode to let us know how we can improve our podcast for you. So thank you for your kind attention, Zoo Assembliers, and see you on the next episode.